Welcome my friends to a new episode of Frameworks. Well in this episode we're going to talk about a wonderful framework and, and, and the reason why I say a wonderful framework because this framework is not about you know um, teaching only language it, it's about teaching content and language at the same time and when I say teaching content and language at the same time I mean by this that we can teach science with this framework, we can teach math with this framework, we can teach physics, we can teach chemistry, um, we can teach many subjects, any subject matter with this framework. It's a lovely, lovely framework. We're going to talk, my friends, today about CLIL or C-L-I-L, -L, Content and Language Integrated Learning. Content and Language Integrated Learning. Now, the whole idea of content and language integrated learning um, appeared in a report by um, Alan Bullock. This report was published in 1975, and it was published by an independent committee chaired by Alan Bullock. And the reason behind this committee was uh, considering the teaching of language. And the main recommendation, the primary recommendation of this committee was that every secondary school should develop a policy for language across the curriculum. And from this came the famous quote, every teacher is a language teacher. Now what does that mean? People in this committee wanted to integrate the teaching of language into the teaching of content. So you're teaching geography, yes, but you're not only teaching geography, also geography has specific language items and has um, specific language with which the students would express geographical information. Now this kind of language needs to be taught through the teaching of content. And that was the whole idea. So there are two main classroom principles for CLIL, or Content and Language Integrated Learning. Principle number one, language is used to learn as well as to communicate. Language is used to learn as well as to communicate. Now, what does that mean? Well, I mean, um, if you want to study chemistry, then chemistry is written in language, right? And again, so in order to study chemistry, you'll be reading language. And again, if you want to discuss chemistry topics with your friends in the classroom, you'll be using language as well. So that is principle number one. Language is for the study of content and also for communication between students and the teacher, students and students in the classroom. Principle number two, it is the subject matter that determines the language you need to focus on as a teacher. So it's not like um, the normal teaching of English language where we say something like, uh, okay, today I'm going to teach the present um, continuous, so I need a text to help me with teaching the present continuous. No, it's not like that. In Khalil, what we do is that the subject matter tells us what we need to focus on, what kind of language we need to focus on. So it's the other way around. So it's not the target language that gets me to choose the text. It is the text that gets me to choose the target language. It is the subject matter. It is the content. And that's, that's a, a very important principle um, in clear teaching. Now, in order to have a successful CLIL lesson, you need to focus on what we call the four C's. And the first C, obviously, is for content. So there has to be a progression in knowledge in the content. So students' understanding of the content needs to be developed because that's the subject matter. The second C is communication. Students need to use the language in order to communicate about the subject matter. 
So if I'm teaching geography, students need to be able to use English to talk about geography and geographical information with the friends in a classroom. So the second C is communication. The third C is for cognition. And when I say cognition, I mean by this, the ability of students to form concept and to understand concepts and to link all that to language. So a Khalil lesson needs to develop students' cognitive skills, being able to understand concept and express these concepts using language. And the fourth C is for culture. So students are exposed to different cultures and um, they're able to understand the difference between um, who they are and who the others are. Okay, that's also another important feature of um, Khalil lessons. Right, so in order to have a wonderful Khalil lesson, you need to take care of the four C's. You need to take care of content, culture, communication, and cognition. Right. Now, someone might ask, but Shadi, what are the language skills we focus on in a Khalil lesson? And I can say all language skills. Students will speak and when they speak, of course, they will listen uh, to their friends and they will listen to the teacher. So speaking and listening are there. Reading and writing, of course, are there. Reading because they're going to read the content and writing, they might write about uh, the content as well. So I say the four skills are in the Khalil framework. So what are the characteristics of a Khalil lesson? And let me say that number one, the integration between language skills, so receptive skills and productive skills in one lesson. Also, Khalil lessons are based on reading and listening texts. So usually in a Khalil lesson, you will have a reading text or a listening text upon which the lesson is based. Also, the language focus in a Khalil lesson does not follow the gradual okay, um, structure that we follow in normal um, English language course books. Like, it's not about we have to start with a prison simple and then move to the prison continuous and then go to the, um, uh, the past and then past continuous and all that. No, no, no. I mean, um, uh, because as we said, it's the content uh, that makes the teacher choose the target language. It is the content that controls um, uh, the choice of the target language. And that leads us to the following uh, uh, characteristic, which is language in a Khalil lesson is functional. Um, it's actually language for the sake of expressing uh, information related to the subject matter. And this type of language, and that is also another characteristic, language is actually more lexical than grammatical. So there is more focus on lexis than grammar in clear lessons. And one last characteristic uh, of a good clear lesson is that um, learner's styles. Learner's styles are taken care of in a Khalil lesson. And when I say learner's style, like how students love to learn, some students are kinesthetic, they love to stand and move, some students are auditory, they love to listen, some students are uh, visual, uh, students they love to see, and the like. Now, what are the stages in a Khalil lesson? What is a good framework we can follow in a Khalil lesson? And I can say, so we can say that we start clear lessons with leading normally, um, like every other lesson, and it's to generate students' interest in the topic of the lesson. And then after that, we move to text processing. So that's the stage number two. And in text processing, you're trying to help your students understand the core content in the text you have. And then after text uh, processing, you have organization. That's the third stage. And this is to help students categorize the information and organize the data they studied in the text. Then we come to language identification. And language identification is about identifying the useful language that would help students talk about the subject matter 
and express their ideas about the subject matter and also help students categorize um, this useful language according to its usage. And finally, we come to the tasks stage. And in the tasks stage, students are provided by receptive and productive tasks that would focus students' attention on the subject matter and gives them also more knowledge and deepen their understanding more and more. And finally, of course, you give feedback. So these are the stages of uh, a Khalil lesson. Right. So now, my friends, let's watch a demo lesson um, where I teach methodology uh, and to be specific, um, history of English language teaching. And in this lesson, my subject matter, as I said, was methodology. And I was focusing on um, four characters uh, that affected um, English language teaching, Noam Chomsky, B.F. Skinner, Vygotsky and Piaget. These four um, uh, psychologists affected uh, the teaching of English language to a great extent. And that is the focus um, of um, the topic I'm going to teach. And I followed the stages I talked about now. So what I want you to do is to watch how this Khalil lesson developed, uh, see the stages um, that I followed in teaching uh, this um, lesson. So let's go and watch. Okay, my friends, so we've got here four different characters, um, very famous in the field of um, uh, ELT, English language teaching. What I want you to do, I want you to guess who those people are with your partners and how they affected English language teaching. Is it easy, let me squeeze So two questions, what are they? The first one, who those people are and how they? Excellent, okay, so um, I want you to discuss this with your partners, okay? Okay, right, so what I want you to do, unfold, read the passage and check your discussions see whether you were right or wrong. Go on. Okay, now my friends, in groups of threes, what I want you to do with your partner, who these characters are and how they affected okay, um, the theories of English language acquisition and teaching, right? So let's have the three of you together and the three of you together. Okay, right, ladies and gentlemen, so who are the four people? Yes? Um, Nam Chomsky, Good. Skinner, yeah. Vygotsky and Piaget. And Piaget, okay, yeah, so we've got Noam Chomsky, we've got B.F. Skinner and we've got Piaget and Vygotsky. Right, and now, how, how did those people affect, okay, um, English language teaching in the whole universe on, and, and through the history of ELT. Um, who's ready for that? Mm. Yes? So, that's what I'm not made of the book. Okay, so let's start by B.S. Kenner. Uh, he was responsible, or he coined, he started the behaviorists. Uh, it's where he says that, for example, if a child is trying to, to say something and he's trying to learn, uh, so his mother confirms or she uh, appreciates what he's saying, this is like a motivation. Um, but then, uh, Neil Chomsky became, he said that it doesn't actually explain the massive repertoire that, mm. that, the, uh, that, that we have. He said that maybe we have uh, something that we call or we call it uh, the term in mm. um, uh, And he says that it's like advice in our minds mm. and it is responsible for acquiring language. And he also uh, talked about universal grammar. He maybe this is a, this is the term that he used to just say that um, we have the, the concept, we have the concept, we try to express that in different 
they're, they're kind of a balance between the two opinions, right? Between um, Chomsky and um, and B.F. Skinner, right? Because they said that uh, you you don't only need you know uh, physical development, you also need emotional, emotional development, and then they put these two together. Exactly. Right. Wonderful. So again, I mean, the effect of those uh, four people um, on English language teaching was actually huge. Now, what we're going to do, we're going to read this passage again, but this time more carefully. And we need to organize the information here in this chart. Okay. So what do we have in this chart? We have the three theories and the three proponents, view of language, and view of language acquisition process. What you need to do, read it carefully and organize information, kind of summarize everything in here. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy? Okay, good. Right.
I want you to help each other. So, together, work together here. Okay, my friends, let's talk. So, um, let's talk about the first theory, which is behaviorism, and who is the proponent? B.F. Skinner. Okay, so B.F. Skinner. And what about the view of language? Uh, that's a foreign repetition. Okay. It's like a person with a habit of repetition. Uh, good, good habits should be great, or and bad habits should, should be uh, good, always correct. Okay. And receiving positive reactions as well as motivation. Okay, wonderful. Yes? And view language and structure. Struct okay, wonderful. Right, very good. Now what about um, the second theory for the proponent Chomsky? What is the theory? Innate. Yeah, okay. So language is innate, that's wonderful. Right, and what is the view of language, Omar? Uh, the view of language, uh, that the language involves creativity and recognition, uh, and uh, language is like any other biological, uh, in the position, any other biological uh, functions like mm. walking, and language is in, 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 in acquired as dormant. Uh, mm. uh, and uh, that we have a language that is in voice uh, that allows us to like, decode and recreate uh, mm. the sentences uh, to be uh, uh, Hmm. And the view of language acquisition process for um, 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 Chomsky? It views the language acquisition process as means. Hmm. Uh, hmm. Like if it happens, uh, uh, I look at the word and in the same, uh, by the same uh, process, like hmm. it doesn't uh, change. Okay, wonderful. Now let's go to the last theory. And the view of language in the last theory, language is innate but not separate from other mental developments. What is this uh, theory? Cognitive. Cognitive theory, right. And the proponents for this theory? Piaget and? Very good. And what about the view of language acquisition process? It emerges when there is a need. When? It emerges when there is a need. When there is a need, right. And this need is? Emotional, emotional needs, right. Okay, not only physical mm -hmm. development. Wonderful, good, good, good. So, my friends, now, I have here the passage one more time. But in this passage, you will notice that some vocabulary items are in bold. What I want you to do is to match these items in bold to their definitions. Easy it easy, lemon squeezy? Let's do that. Pass it to your friends. Yes. Now, help each other. So, both of you together. Together. Here you are.
Okay, right. So let's go the, to the first one. The total number of things that someone or something is able to do. Okay, very good. Related to the process of knowing, understanding and learning something? Cognitive, right. A theory of psychology which states that human and animal behavior can and should be studied only in terms of physical processes without reference to mind. Behaviorism, okay. With the prediction or support of a person. Yes, aegis, right? Okay. A theory which claims to account for the grammatical competence of every adult. Very good. Something that encourages more of a particular activity. Stimulus, very good. Something that encourages, oh yes, we did this one. An attempt to start something such as a speech which falls because you were not properly prepared or ready to begin. Very good. Something that hasn't been planned or organized, but happens by itself. Nice. An opinion that is stated publicly. Very good. A conclusion or statement that does not logically follow from the previous argument or statement. Non sequiturs. Non sequiturs. Yeah. Something that seems similar between two situations. Very good. Relating to the meanings of words. Good job, my friends. Right. So, one last thing I've got here a list of statements. These statements are related to language acquisitions, or of them, right? One way or another. What I want you to do, read every statement carefully and decide on how much you agree or disagree with it. Okay? Take your time first, then later I'll give you time to discuss. Right? Easy peasy? Okay, let's have a group discussion. So let's have the three of you together, the three of you, see whether you agree or disagree with these statements.
So, um, tell me something interesting um, that you raised uh, during the discussion. Hmm. Yes? We spoke about uh, with the first and second language of the Oh, okay. And, ha and how do you feel personally about this? Uh, they are not alone. Why? Uh, because the, the, the first language that doesn't happen to a different age, and age matters, of course. Mm. And of course, when you acquire second language, your, your mind is not blank, like when you acquire first language. Like when you acquire first language, it is the only thing there, so you can uh, process everything. Mm. But with a second language, you have a language in your mind. So it, mm. take, it, it affects you. Okay, I love that. And also you can add a point that would be also another difference that the, at the, the, the atmosphere is different. Okay. When you learn in a first language, everybody is usually uh, speaking the, first, uh, the same language, right? But it's, it's not the same scenario when you're acquiring a second language. You, you, you can be trying to acquire a second language in, for example, a country that does not speak that language and that's also another factor well that's that's a very interesting point what else was like very interesting for you uh, okay like uh, like they've got uh, what you mean here is they have parents that come from different nationalities that's what you're trying to say yeah. oh well yeah okay yeah well mm. 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 that's interesting that's interesting well however I mean we don't know whether those usually those parents oh yeah they might be speaking to the child in different language well that's yeah. bloody confusing eh yeah. <laughs> right bloody hell yeah mm. what else mm. yeah. Can you raise your voice again? Yes. Okay, so no one alone doesn't mean that the language can be used effectively in interaction. It reminded us of Grandma Tyson by Diana Ross and Queen, and she's had that uh, mm. actually. Um, so to use grammar, uh, grammar accurately or to use structures accurately while it's speaking, this is a good skill uh, mm. in language. And uh, if Scott Thornberry also talked about this, that's the point, the term grammar to mm. grammar. Mm. He was saying that yes, we know. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I really agree with this one, right? Because knowing grammar rules doesn't mean that you'll be able to use the grammar rules when you're speaking. And I love the analogy that uh, Scott Thornberry mentioned in one of his books. He said that it's like driving um, a, a motorcycle or a car. I, I can tell you about the rules of driving a car. You can memorize them. That doesn't mean that you can drive a car. It's just, you know, memorizing the rules and knowing them is, is, is something. And practice, the real practice, is something that is uh, completely different. Hmm. 
Um, one last point. Um, that Well, that, that, that is interesting. So you're in between here. Yeah. So it's not helpful if I'm going to interrupt my students in a freer practice. Well, yeah. Like, it's try to correct every single mm. thing that mm. would not be helpful. Of, mm. Yeah. Mm. of course, totally agree with that. Yeah. And as you said, it's about how and when, when you correct and how you do it. Right, right, right. Lovely. Okay. Um, so, um, Thank you so much. So my friends, as you saw, it was a Khalil lesson. And as you saw in the video, I was teaching six wonderful um, British teachers and the subject matter was methodology. And um, as you saw, I moved through all the stages we talked about, starting with leading, text processing, organization, language identification, tasks, and then finally feedback. So any subject matter can be taught the same way. Think about science, think about geography, think about history, think about physics, you name it. Okay, um, the beauty of this framework that is so adaptable and you can use it for your subject matter. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And don't forget, I'll be down there in the comments if you have any questions and I will respond to you immediately. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.